All right, hey guys, welcome to the Daily Word, verse by verse. <coughs> Grab your Bibles and follow along as we continue. All right, hey guys. Oh. As we continue to, uh, okay, as we continue to st our the study through Matthew chapter, we are in chapter six, and um, this is a. Again, an exciting study, um, as I have the, the the words of Jesus have, have always been relevant, of course, of revelation. Okay, because anything he does is a revelation. But the reason why I'm kind of I'm, I'm saying this is because too, and one of the reasons why I have such a passion for studying the Bible it's what is teaching the Bible was studying the Bible verse by verse chapter by chapter and book by book is because um, we know without a doubt this is what Jesus has given us uh, what we can't be sure of is man's interpretation man's views right we those we can't be sure of and the reason why I say that is because whenever you have um, teachings and doctrines that y you you see passages in scriptures that contradict that, and we're going to you you'll understand why I'm saying this now as we get into this passage. But um, whenever you see a, you have a position, and then you're reading. And you see this passage contradicts your position. Of course, you should go with uh, with scripture. And unfortunately, people wrestle most with whether or not I should go with scripture or continue on how I've been taught, what my pastor has said, things like that. So, again, Matthew chapter five, Jesus is again giving his disciples. His criteria for being his disciple. This is his standard. And so we should be able to um, gauge our walk, our standards, by God's standards, what Jesus is saying here. Now, um, of course, he starts off by, again, telling us the qualities we should possess. And then that the purpose that we're here. <clears throat> In other words, his disciples. Um, which is not a political, not a political purpose, not a cultural purpose. Um, one of the sad things is that Christ many Christians are Americans first, then Christian. That their Christianity at best is on equal par with their culture. Instead of their Christianity being supreme and again Jesus is saying that's not good enough and remember he even said our purpose here is to let our light shine not the culture not patriotism anything else but let our light shine okay now so all of that all I'm saying is as we're moving through this Sermon on the Mount it everything that he is saying is reflecting of that in contrast to the hypocrisy of religion, of man's religion. And of course, in context, the hypocrisy of the Pharisees. And so all of these things, and we talk about the, you know, even, even the, 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 as he's going through talking about the Ten Commandments, the commandments, and then he's amplifying it, saying, okay, well, you've, you've heard that it said, thou shalt not kill, but if you're angry with your brother, See, Jesus standards is higher if you say thou should not commit adultery but if you're looking on a woman to lust after her okay um, um, you commit adultery with her already in your heart his standards is higher now let me also say that even though these commands in some points seem like they're impossible to keep that's the point because the law brings you to Christ and so that your faith in Christ 
that he is the fulfillment of the law he is the um, 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 uh, propitiation for our sins that's where this should go so not in other words this is not to leave us hopeless but for sure what he wants to do is destroy any thought any thought he wants to annihilate any thought that you can by good deeds good works holy living in short your own human effort obtain righteousness with God that the only way you can obtain righteousness with God is through him all right so we left off at uh, in Matthew chapter 6 and we're going to go to verse 19 um, if you remember he, he talked about prayer and then um, praying forgiveness the Lord's Prayer and remember he even said don't be like the hypocrites right don't stand on the corners and pray or make long elaborate prayers people do that he says uh, have a, they want to be seen by men and thus he says you're gonna have your reward but let your motives be pure let your works be pure before God in other words if you're doing good and the idea wasn't that if you you write a it, whatever good you do obviously someone is going to see it but he's saying if you're doing it to be seen of men to be praised by men to be acknowledged by men if, if that's your motive he says your reward is that praise that acknowledgement but it won't be a it won't be a reward from God <clears throat> all right verse 19 um, verse 19 and he says don't collect for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal but collect for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break break in and steal for where your treasures for where your treasures is there your hearts will be also now this is <coughs> excuse me this is um certainly one of the most I guess again the promises that we that we're going to see here that God is going to take care of us one of the promises that um, um, the promises I'm coming in a little fuzzy here it seems like in Facebook uh, okay I cannot control that unfortunately I don't know if I'm coming in fuzzy at any place else but you know on my iPad here I am coming in fuzzy okay anyway but um, when he says um, let's go back don't collect for yourself treasures on earth um, now what does he mean because throughout the centuries there have been people who have made the interpretations that poverty equals pious piety if you're poor um, then you, you you're some kind of way more godly more pious all that and and nothing can be further from the truth again notice what he's saying that your life's work if, if you're if everything about your life work is that you are um, storing up that your, your your whole devotion of life is earning riches and there is something about that you see when you are when you are in fact remember uh, in 2nd Timothy Paul says the love of money is the root of all evil the love of money not money itself but the love of money now I like to be one that I would certainly try to convince God that he could trust me with a hundred billion dollars that I would be generous that I would look, look at all what I would fund 
you know, with my mind that I have right here, right, that if I had a hundred billion dollars, look what all the good I can do, right? Well, God doesn't buy that, first of all. He, he doesn't, you know, because again, he doesn't need my money. He doesn't need anyone's money. And um, what he is saying, however, is that, yes, the churches run off the generosity of the members. The churches um, are supported by, ministries are supported by the generosity of people. Jesus himself had people who regularly supported him. Um, so, my, here's my point. And let me throw, throw this kind of in too. That um, we're not under the Old Testament in the sense of the precepts and the commands. So, let's say tithing would fall into that. And I get into much discussions on people about this issue of tithing. Let me just say this. There's not one New Testament command that, that where even Jesus himself or any of his apostles command the Christian church to tithe. It just doesn't. It just you. I, I've again. I've had this kind of discussion before, and let me just say again, it doesn't exist. People, it, so so why do pastors teach it as if it is a command? You know, use Malachi. Will a man rob God? Will you, will a man rob God? Right. So they use the fear, the guilt, the terror. Don't mess with God. Then, of course, they also, there's teachings that use uh, covetousness. I'm going to get to that in a moment, but covetousness. The, the love of money, the, the, the covet of wealth, okay? Um, but there's not one scripture that where, where, where God commands tithing. In fact, there's not even a mention in terms of teaching tithing. It, it, it's, it, it's not. And people, again, they, again, because people get into their religious minds, they want to. They have those scriptures out. That, that, again, it's just not there. You know why? Let me tell you why. Exactly what we're studying here. Let me go back. This is why. Don't collect for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust is destroyed with these break through and steal. But collect for yourself treasures in heaven. Neither moth or rust destroy the thieves, not break them and steal for where your treasures is there will your heart be also look at the next verse the eye of the eye is the lamp of the body if your eye is good your whole body will be full of light but if your eye is bad your whole body will be full of darkness so if the light that is in you is darkness how great is that darkness no one can serve no no one can be a slave to two masters so either he will hate the one I love the other, or to be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot be a, you cannot be a, be slaves of God and now notice this, money. And so one of the interesting things here is, the New Testament elevates us greater than ten percent. See, now the the problem is pastors go after ten percent, not spiritual development. See, if you go through, if you go after spiritual development, spiritual growth, notice this. You're going to, God has your heart. The true Christian, the true believer, what? God has our heart. And so that's what ought to reflect our lives, which ultimately would reflect our giving. That our giving is reflected in the heart that we have towards God. So that if my motive, my thoughts, my life, my desires is all consumed with just having. Let me, uh, uh, let's see here. Let me go to, I'm going to show you something. Look at Hebrews. This is Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13. And in verse 5, it says, Let your conduct, not as what conduct, of course, is way of life, 
be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will, I will not fear what man can do to me. Many of us cannot say that right now. Many of us, we do fear the bill collector. I mean, you don't even answer your phone, right? Because you know it's a bill collector. And certainly, our whole lives is set up. Now think about this. Our entire lives can be set up on the basis and especially right now the reason why people <clears throat> prosper and let me I can't I'm I want to throw it in the reason why for example the prosperity message uh, is effective is it well put let me rephrase the prosperity message is only effective in as the economy is good right in other words, if an economy is not doing so good, neither is the word of faith. Their churches, their ministries, right? Why? Because the people, if you think about this right now, uh, the COVID is hitting, um, the COVID is hitting uh, the world, but especially our country because America is number one. And I'm gritting my teeth because I'm resisting to want to really tear into why. But COVID-19 is ravishing our nation because the numbers that keep growing up. And if the numbers that keep growing up, that means people cannot earn income. That people cannot earn income. In other words, it is slowing the wheel of economy in our nation. Um... So that means giving is down in churches, right? COVID-19 has done something that we haven't seen, I want to say ever, where <clears throat> you can't go to church on Sundays. And that, by the way, going to church on Sundays is not, the reason why the biggest issue with going to church on Sundays is people still, churches got to pay their bills, right? Churches got to pay their bills. Now, the building itself, the 501c3 institution, that's, 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 that's not God's house. And I'm not here saying we should not have it, but the point is when you have a situation like where COVID-19 now has to restrict for, for the most part, ever since right, church, churches have been closed down. But that shouldn't stop ministry. Should it? It shouldn't stop ministry. Guess what? The church started house to house. Social media, social media, that which I'm on here, you know, Periscope, YouTube, Facebook, wonderful ways where we can have house to house ministry. The problem is that it, it you know, uh, <laughs> pastors want people. One of the chief reasons why a lot of pastors want people to congregate, get the money. Okay, get the money. All right. Here's my point. But if you are ministering, let me go back to this verse here in Hebrews. Because here, if my heart is right, notice this. If my heart is right, let my life be without covenants and be content with such things as I, as, as I have. For he himself has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. So it may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. And here's the interesting thing about this verse right here. The Lord is my helper. I won't fear what man would do for me. And if you're living in a life right now that your job, right, you must go to work. And some people will go to work if they're sick. Why? Because they got to pay for that big house. you got to pay for that car. you gotta, <coughs> you got to pay those credit cards bill. Why? Because covetousness has driven, right, covetousness has driven us to always what? Want more and more and more. Have, have, and have. And so marketing and the whole economy is based upon what covetous right i want to buy a new car right now and i can tell you right now i looked on some sites right now and and all of a sudden now all of my social media is sending me messages to say buy a car and and and, and, and my flesh wants me to dilute myself to say you know god is speaking to me about buying a new car no it's just i clicked on the wrong 
uh, algorithm and not next thing you know that they're flooding my mind covet they're staring up covetousness right advertising is the to the point I mentioned covetous covetousness is to the point that the reason why you have TV YouTube and all these other places Facebook right the reason is for advertising it's not for content not for your favorite TV show your favorite television show gets you in front of the screen so that they can what feed you with advertising and then it does what feeds you with covetousness it stirs your covetousness so notice he says be content with such things as you have let your life be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have now so we're going to come down back to uh matthew uh that's not what i want matthew chapter 19 right notice this the eye of the eye is the lamp of the body and if your eye is good your whole body will be full of light but if your your eye is bad your whole body will be full of darkness so if the light is in you is darkness how great is the darkness why and he makes the point no one can serve two masters money you can't be a slave to God or money so now um, verse 25 this is why I tell you don't worry about your life now remember in Hebrews he tell us he told us not to let our lives be with covetousness he says don't worry about your life what you will eat what you would drink with your body uh, or about your body what you will wear All right we know that fashion is one of the biggest industries right look at the birds of the sky now this is kind of interesting because he's getting ready to tell us something about covetousness right and wary and, and when he says wary the anxiety of what think about the cycle of life the cycle of just a single day what is this consumed of going to work right um, making money right back in more simpler times your day consumed of getting up doing chores preparing for meals uh, doing all of these things right now is the, the shift has been you want more money so you can have more leisure time you can have more money to spend right but then that creates what again covetous wary because how am I gonna pay the bills um, there, if if you're at a point that you can't afford to take a day off, you can't even afford to be sick. He says, stop worrying. Now, um, verse twenty-five. Look at the birds of the sky. Now I'm gonna ask a question and I'm gonna read this. Why why does he want us to look at the birds of the sky? Alright, keep that thought in mind. They don't sow or reap or gather into barns, yet your heavenly father feeds them. Aren't you worth more than they? Can any one of you add a single cubit to his height? By worrying. Now I'm gonna stop to say that because uh, when I think about these things, I often think, well, there was I was reading a, a while ago where a guy did add to his uh, height one of the most excruciating things to even see this guy he was a short man and I, and, and 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 he actually added some inches and and the, the the things people do to change their appearance and stuff is just unbelievable notice God said why were you worrying about that and there's something to be said about that that guy too by the way think about this now you have people that say I'm gonna worry about my height so they go to these extreme measures but they actually drill bolts in it and they do a whole bunch of silly stuff but think about this now think about plastic surgery people worry about how they look so you get plastic surgery now why do you why do people will spend money <laughs> to look younger 
Now just think about that for a moment. Why do people so have such anxiety about that? The, the acceptance, but why? And then what is the acceptance worth? Okay, you know, when you, if I think about certain celebrities, that's got, you can tell they've gotten tons and tons of plastic surgery. What is that worth? And, and, here's a, and, and the greater thing is, why are we so consumed with that anxiety? Verse 27 again, can anyone add a single cubit to his height by wearing? Why do you worry about clothes? Learn how the wild flower, flowers of the field grow. They don't labor or spin a thread. Yet, I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor with adorn like one of these. Now, if God, verse 30, if that's how God clothes the grass of the field, which today, uh, which is here today and thrown in the furnace tomorrow, won't he do much more for you, O oh, you of little faith? Now, why? think about this for a moment. Why does God tell us to consider the birds? Right? Why does he tell us to consider the birds? Why, why does he tell us? Um, why does he tell us to consider the birds? Why does he tell us to consider the, the flowers? It says God clothes the flowers. It's with the tape, right? Scenery is great and wonderful. But think about this. You tell me to consider a bird. Birds. Now, here is the interesting thing. The creation really just, they are doing what God wants them to or what they, they are fulfilling what God has created them for. So the birds just fly around. That's what God created them for. The flowers just grow up and they adorn the scenery. That's what God created them for. <coughs> God created the, the flowers to give beauty to scenery. That's it. They don't sit up and go, oh, you know, I don't feel like going out today. No. Here's the point. He says, so when you are fulfilling what God wants you to do, God is going to take care of you. God is the one that's going to take care of you. If you are spending your life consumed with fulfilling your own dreams, then you're not in sync with God. And that's what he's talking about here. When he says, remember in Hebrews, let me go back. Uh... Let your life, verse 5, let, let your conduct be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So that we boldly say, the Lord, see, the Lord is my helper. And I will not fear what man do to me. The Lord is my helper. And I won't fear what man does to me. Now notice he didn't say that you couldn't work and have goals and achieve. That's not what he's talking about right here. But if your life is just consumed with that, you know, one of the, the Japanese culture, they're taught and, and conditioned to think that their entire life should be devoted to work, working for the, 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 the uh, corporation. And there was a time, this was many, many years ago, but they would show how that was such a focus on them, they wouldn't even take breaks. They were, in some cases, they were just falling out. But if you're that concerned, that, and that's his point, you, you're, you're missing what God wanted. You're missing God's purpose. Um, so verse 31 says, So don't worry saying, what will we eat? Or what will we drink? Or what will we wear? For the dieters eagerly seek all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be provided for you. 
therefore don't worry about tomorrow because tomorrow will worry about itself each day has enough trouble of its own and that's certainly true isn't it each day brings about its own set of trouble or circumstances or situations again notice he says don't worry about these things don't worry about don't say how are we going to eat um but notice he says seek first the kingdom of god seek first the kingdom of god and his righteousness and all of these things will be added unto you so again let me tell you what he's not saying again he is not saying don't go to school and better yourself don't don't be a better employment employee don't work to be a better employee don't um you know don't um uh don't you know do better for your life he's not even saying that you can't be rich but if that is your whole and by the way in colossians you know he tells us that covetousness is a dietary because when people focus so on make wealth now i'm going to say what's always amazing to me is uh then you have certain teachings right that teaches us that we should be pursuing these things they just teach us to, to pursue them in faith pursue them by giving right i told you earlier you go to some of these services where they have sacrificial giving and even as i said even with tithing there, there's not one new testament scripture that commands or even teach God's people to tithe. But here's the thing I want to say about this. That if a pastor is teaching and feeding his flock right. And the word of God. He's sowing the word of God in the hearts of people. People's heart would be towards God. And they will give. They will give far beyond the 10%. You know. And, uh, but the idea is that too, one of the, the allures of the prosperity movement is that it, 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 it promised something that to date, no one can even say that they've prospered. If I say, well, okay, you've been, you know, you've been tithing for the last 50 years. Where are the windows of heaven? Blessings. And people make all kinds of excuses. They dummy down it. Well, you know, I got to. I got I to gotta raise on my job, right? Or my gas bill got paid. That's not what he's talking about, though. That's not the promise. The promise of the hundredfold return and these prosperities is that you're supposed to be wealthy beyond your dream, wealthy beyond your imaginations. Where is that? But again, remember I said earlier, when you have a teaching, and now as we're reading this, this contradicts that, doesn't it? Living your best life, enjoying your everyday life, your dreams, turning your dreams into destiny, five steps when you can have whatever you want. Notice here, this all contradicts that because Jesus says, look, you seek first the kingdom of God. I'm going to put this together with Hebrews. The Lord will be my helper. If I'm seeking first the kingdom of God, I can boldly say God is the one. Because I'm content. Let me also challenge one other thing. See, the contentment is not that I'm content to say I don't have running water. Or my, I don't have lights or I don't I don't have whatever right I don't have more the contentment is I know let me go back to this here is the contentment verse 33 look at verse 32 well idolaters eagerly seek all these things and your heavenly father knows you need them but seek first the kingdom of God <coughs> excuse me, and his righteousness and all these things will be provided for you. That's the contentment that my heavenly father knows what I need. That my heavenly father 
cares for me that my Heavenly Father will provide for me that's where our focus should be that's where our hope faith should be that God knows and God will open the doors so if God wants to open the door and I get that hundred billion hundred million hundred no yeah no hundred billion dollars Here's the thing, whether I have a hundred billion or a hundred dollars, guess what? That doesn't change. You know why? It doesn't change because my hope will always remain in God because God is worth a lot more than any amount of money. And I'm not pretending that less money is better. I trust me, as I often say, I don't want you know, uh, I don't I don't want Bill Gates money. I mean I don't want I don't want to be I don't want to be like Bill Gates. I just want his money. However, I don't need his money. I have my Heavenly Father. And my Heavenly Father already said he would take care of me. And I have, that's the, to me the growth to get there, that God will take care of me. That Lord, if, if it comes from you, and as James said, every good gift, every perfect gift comes from God. If it comes from you, if it comes from God, I'm not only content, but I know I'm going to be happy because whatever God gives me is good. And the fact that God will provide for me is good. And that's in every aspect of my life. So my concern should be seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And guess what? That means let me fulfill what God has called me to do. Let me let my light shine. In other words, see the the, the trajectory of life is different between those who are believers seeking first the kingdom of God and then those who are not. All right, guys, chapter 7 in our next study. Matthew chapter 7, our next study. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. I'll see you next time. All right.